We are right there on the high seas as a Chinese destroyer gets provocatively close to a Canadian warship. Tonight, an exclusive glimpse at a risky encounter. Get your safe distance with me. Face to face with a superpower in the waters off Taiwan. David Common is on board. A new test for university students heading back to class. Find a place to live. I even saw an ad like renting a hallway for $400. A hallway. And after a summer of political change, that issue is back with the polls and the pressure. A lot can shift in just a few months. This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. We begin tonight with a story you'll only see on CBC News, a close encounter in a tense part of the world involving a Canadian frigate and a Chinese guided missile destroyer. That encounter playing out in front of our cameras. So tonight, we take you aboard the HMCS Ottawa as it takes part in a joint mission in the Indo-Pacific to demonstrate the right to sail through international waters. David Common is on that ship for us tonight, and he has exclusive access as that encounter continues in international waters off the coast of Taiwan. So, David, the moment of tension, I gather, is not over. It certainly is not, Adrian. As we speak to you from the helicopter deck here on HMCS Ottawa, there is a Chinese destroyer over there and over there, flanking both sides of this Canadian frigate as it journeys through the East China Sea. China's Navy has grown increasingly assertive on the high seas, especially around Taiwan, but rarely do we get to see it like this. This is Chinese we have exclusive access on this Canadian Navy vessel as it's conducting exercises with the U.S. and Japanese navies when this Chinese warship appears. This is what China pushing back against other powers looks like. It brings a risk of collision and the opportunity to gaze at an adversary. Commander Sam Patchell is the captain of this ship. We're not even in the Taiwan Strait. We're not in contested waters. And there's a Chinese warship right there. They're operating near the waters, their, their own waters. And, so, and we're just operating in this open ocean. Um, they're as curious about, I think, our behavior as we are of theirs. This one encounter is an example of how China is seeking greater influence and control of the waters around its neighbors, sending what is now the world's largest navy further from its shores, sometimes dangerously so, like this at-sea close call in June when a Chinese warship cut off an American naval vessel crossing the Taiwan Strait. China is basically trying to exert the same types of controls that companies do over national waterways. And if they can't do that, to harass uh, other people that are going through those areas uh, and make it uncomfortable for people to exercise the right of free uh, uh, passage on the open ocean. Unloaded, ready to fire. It means Canada's Navy may not expect a fight, but it is prepared for one. All three nations here believe in a free and open Indo-Pacific. Just as the US, Japan and Canada line up their ships to take a picture, the Chinese warship is still there on the edge, parallel to their adversaries. Then, following the Canadians on their onward journey, a shadow on the seas. As you said, David, there have been close calls before during previous missions and, I gather, other encounters on this one. Yeah, in fact, just in the past few days, Adrian, we have seen Chinese drones, Chinese fighter jets, all operating in the same vicinity, broad area, as this ship. Now we see, you know, this destroyer, Chinese destroyer, that actually was going the other way, pulled a U-turn in the ocean, is now mirroring all of our movements. Really a sign of something that is likely to continue on this four-month deployment of HMCS Ottawa. All right, David Common on the HMCS Ottawa. Now, China's activity in this country is now the focus of a public inquiry, specifically allegations of foreign interference in Canada's federal elections and concerns it could happen again. As Rafi Bujakanian tells us, the federal Liberals made it official today after months of pressure from the opposition. 
After a summer of negotiations, a highly anticipated announcement. There will be a public inquiry into foreign interference. We have arrived with the full support of the opposition uh, at the best person to lead this inquiry. That person, Quebec Court of Appeal Judge Marie-José Hogue, tasked with looking into meddling during the last two federal elections. Foreign interference in Canadian democratic institutions uh, is unacceptable. But an inquiry was hardly the Liberals' first choice. Faced with news stories about Chinese meddling in elections, they appointed a special rapporteur, former Governor General David Johnston, triggering opposition outrage. He later recommended against an inquiry, then eventually resigned. Never forget that Justin Trudeau has tried to do everything to avoid this. The Conservatives always said a public inquiry was the only option and they accept the choice of Og. If there's any foreign state actor that's interfering in our elections, that, uh, that, that, that should be uncovered and dealt with. Og's mandate is not limited to China. It could include Russia and non-state actors. This former Conservative MP who blames Beijing for his election loss says the scope may be too broad. Russia and uh, Iran are not setting up official uh, police service station in Canada. So, so you know, there, is, there has to be and there should be a priority with uh, deal with uh, how deep and how wide China interference in Canada has been. But this national security expert is optimistic Og will shed some light on the issue. I hope that the first thing that she does is, is to prepare a fairly comprehensive inventory of what's happened not only directly on the elections, but on what's happened between elections. Og herself has said little. She'll start her work on September 18th. A final report is due by the end of 2024, a tight timeline that could be within months of the next federal election. Rafi Wujikani on CBC News, Ottawa. Federal Conservatives are meeting tonight and into the weekend to begin honing their strategy to win that next election. It's Pierre Polyev's first policy convention as leader. And as Kate McKenna tells us, the party is eager to maintain recent momentum in the polls. A packed house for the first Federal Conservative Party convention in five years. And they say the party is just getting started. Look, I think the energy is great here. Uh, a lot of optimism in the crowd. I think people are seeing the latest poll numbers, although we always try not to pay attention to those and get too bogged down. This is the momentum the party wants to keep. People flocking to events, putting money in their coffers. Then there are those strong polling numbers. Some have Polyev's Conservatives 10 percentage points ahead of the Liberals. Just really excited about the response we're getting from voters under Pierre Polyev's leadership. Conservatives will get back to the common sense of the common people. Polyev has drawn delegates from far and wide who see him as their very own maverick. Yeah, I like, you know, he is uh, very honest, very outstanding, very upfront, and he's a very young person. You know, he understands what Canada needs. But a smooth convention is not a guarantee. Polyev has been hammering the government over affordability issues, but some in the party want to debate social issues like banning vaccine mandates and ending mandatory diversity training. There's one resolution that calls to ban children under 18 from receiving puberty blockers. I respect the rights and dignity of all Canadians, including members of the community. I also respect and have faith in the capacity of the Conservative Party membership to have respectful and compassionate debates. Whatever resolutions do pass, they're not binding. But they could force Polyev to walk a tightrope, keeping the party's base happy while still appealing to the broader Canadian public. Kate McKenna, CBC News, Quebec City. More on the Conservative Party convention and Pierre Polyev's big summer when Rosie and the panel kick off a brand new season of Ad Issue in 20 minutes. Now, university students in many Canadian cities are struggling to find a place to live. Kale Hounsell shows why in Halifax it could be even more challenging and what some are doing to just get by. Isadora Schumann Munoz is focused on her studies now, but it hasn't been easy. It's been so hard to find a place. I've been bouncing like from residence to like houses were really bad. Like she says the search is a struggle. I even saw an ad like renting a hallway for $400, a hallway. There are six universities in Halifax. The city is seeing a population boom that began during the pandemic. 
Since then, wildfires destroyed homes and put another 150 people in the rental market, and the vacancy rate is 1%. So my roommate actually ended up looking on Airbnb to see if they would switch to an eight-month lease. This student lives with her parents in Bridgewater, 100 kilometers away. So what would you do if your parents didn't live here in Nova Scotia? That's a really good question. I probably wouldn't know what to do. Tara Carter wound up homeless a few months ago and says there are still students who have no place to live. I let them borrow my tent for a couple nights. Um, they were camping out in a friend's backyard. In fact, the housing situation has become so desperate, this university, the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design, recently reached out to an emergency women's shelter asking for help. So I was like, are you joking? The nonprofit says it is overburdened. The school says it wasn't asking directly for housing, just advice. Here is another sign the disaster that we are experiencing here in Halifax and probably across the country. They're your students, how are you helping them? Right, so each of us has a housing office directing students, giving them the tools that they need to be successful in the search for uh, affordable housing in the domestic market. In a longer term, we're all working uh, to increase capacity. For now, I think we're all just trying to help each other. So all students have somewhere to sleep. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. The star of that 70s show, Denny Masterson, has been sentenced to 30 years to life in prison for raping two women. We're committed to making sure that justice gets served, and today they got it. Both attacks happened at his home in L.A. in 2003. The sentence was the maximum jail time allowable. Masterson was convicted in May after a previous mistrial. An Ontario man allegedly linked to more than 110 deaths worldwide is due back in court tomorrow. And tonight, the mother of one of his suspected victims is speaking out for the first time. Thomas Degla now with her son's story and her push for better mental health services. Kim Prosser has spent hours on the shores of Lake Erie trying to heal since the death of her son Ashton last March. He was a month away from his 20th birthday. It was like all of this potential is it's just gone. She's the first parent to speak publicly about a loved one's suicide that prosecutors blame on Kenneth Law. Accused of selling a potentially lethal substance online, Law is facing 14 charges of counseling or aiding suicide in Ontario. Kim suspects Ashton found a pro-suicide forum that led him to Law when what her son really needed was help. We're not doing enough. There isn't support for everyone who's struggling in, in mental health. She says Ashton's mental health declined when his high school classes went virtual early in the pandemic. Around the world, families are speaking of their late loved one's struggles, with law suspected of links to more than 110 deaths in multiple countries. He's destroyed lives, so many lives. Depression. Imogen Nunn was known to her TikTok followers as Deaf Immy, raising awareness about the deaf community and mental health until she took her own life this year. It was really difficult to get access to deaf mental health services. Law was arrested near Toronto in May. Now police in BC, Alberta and Saskatchewan all say they're investigating. Law sent 160 packages across Canada allegedly marketing products to vulnerable clients. To see someone who might be promoting or, or talking about suicide as a, a way to, to feel better is, is really hard to watch. As for Prosser, she plans to start a foundation in her son's memory, knowing those who need support aren't always getting it. Those tattoos symbolize her family and were drawn by Ashton, a part of him she'll keep forever. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. If you or anyone you know is in crisis, help is available. To speak to someone, you can call 1-833-456-4566. That line is active 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You can also text 45645 from 4 to midnight Eastern Time. Now, the total number of wildfires burning across the country is now more than 1,000, most of them out of control, and the season may be far from over. Ongoing warm and dry weather may contribute to new fire starts and there remains a likelihood that some existing fires 
may continue to be active through September and possibly later into autumn or even winter. More than 16 million hectares has been burned so far, a combined area of destruction more than three times the size of Nova Scotia. Now, some of that scorched earth is astonishingly close to Yellowknife, precisely why that three-week evacuation went into effect. Mercifully, the risk has receded. Residents are returning, the city up and running. Aaron Collins shows us the signs of the city's close call and the danger that remains. Job one for many returning to the capital, filling fridges and cupboards. Reunions amidst the produce, a bonus. Many here still waiting to reconnect with loved ones. Looking forward to seeing them. We miss them a lot. Grocery stores like the city just getting back up to speed. If you can't find something today, I'm sure we'll have it tomorrow or the next day. Evacuees are returning to a city pretty much as they left it. Water and power flowing. Commercial flights landing at the airport again. The hospital too is up and running, but with some limits. Our ICU is closed, our pediatrics unit is closed, and I think of interest for many people, our labor and delivery unit remains closed. Still, there are scars from Yellowknife's wildfire fight. These fire breaks a reminder that the city was worried it might lose that battle, a chapter residents are hoping to put behind them. Uh, it must be nice to be home. Very nice to be home, especially when you have animals. Like the smoke in the air, the risk of wildfires lingers here, but doesn't rattle people. But as far as any future fires, uh, I'm not worried. Fires are just kind of, I guess, part of the, the new normal now. Pretty much. I think they're just going to keep increasing. Why is that? Uh, it's global warming, climate change. In Ottawa Thursday, an acknowledgement that the fires will be back. A pledge to spend more than $250 million on equipment to fight future wildfires. These wildfires have filled our air with smoke and turned our skies red. And this is a reality. And it is happening now. Of course, nearly 200 wildfires continue to burn across the Northwest Territories. Thousands of people remain out of their homes. And even as Yellowknife slowly fills up again, thoughts of the next time people may be forced to leave lie just below the surface. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Yellowknife. A dramatic manhunt in the UK after a daring jailbreak. This is a, like a catastrophic catalyst of errors. How a man escaped from prison undetected. And the red carpet rolls out for TIFF, but will anyone be on it? People aren't just coming to see a movie, they're coming to see a movie star. Plus, the call for help after a shark attack. Yes, we, we make my day call. Yes. We're back in two. A dramatic rescue mission is unfolding in southern Turkey. An American explorer is trapped nearly a thousand meters underground. Mark Dickey was exploring a mountain cave earlier this week when he suddenly experienced internal bleeding. His condition has since stabilized, but he remains very ill. Rescuers say it could take 10 days to safely bring him out through the narrow, winding passages. And a nationwide manhunt is underway in Britain tonight after a dramatic prison break. He's a former soldier accused of terrorism. And as Chris Brown explains, there are questions tonight about whether he had help. Britain's Wandsworth Prison is a bleak, forbidding place with many layers of security. Yet Danielle Khalif found a way out. Working in the kitchen and wearing a chef's uniform, the 21-year-old apparently clung to the underside of a food delivery truck. That van took a route through London. Um, and we were stopped by the police a short time later uh, and we found evidence to suggest that Daniel had been strapped to the underneath of that vehicle. Khalif, a former British soldier, was awaiting trial on terror offences, accused of planting fake bombs at a military base and trying to elicit information useful to an enemy. Authorities threw a security net around airports and ports, causing long traffic backups. No stone must be left unturned in getting to the bottom of what happened. Who was on duty that morning? In what roles? Ranging from the kitchen to the prison gate, what protocols were in place? This is a, like a 
catastrophic catalyst of errors. This former prison security officer says multiple procedures all failed. A member of staff would have been allocated responsibility for searching the van. We have special mirrors to look underneath. Among the big questions, did Khalif have help? It's those that have help, have safe houses, have um, help getting out of the country that are more difficult to catch. Wandsworth is not among Britain's highest security institutions, so there are other questions about why Khalif was even there. The prison has also been plagued by staff shortages, says a local member of parliament. In December last year, only seven members of staff turned up for a night shift to look after 1,500 inmates. Police called Daniel Khalif a resourceful individual and said skills he learned in the British military likely aided his escape. Chris Brown, CBC News, London. The Toronto International Film Festival kicks off tonight, but many stars are staying home. You take that component out and a lot of the, uh, the air goes out of TIFF. And the effect on businesses. So yeah, definitely it is disappointing. A trip around the world turns into a rescue mission. We lost the boat. It's a catastrophe. But first, Rosie's here with that issue. There's my pal. Hey, Adrian, we return after a summer of political change. Liberals are trying to turn around their fortunes and deal with Pierre Polyev's momentum. Chantal, Althea and Andrew join me to talk about that. Celebrated Canadian author Peter C. Newman has died at the age of 94. Over the course of his career, Newman penned more than two dozen books and was known for chronicling the lives of some of Canada's most powerful people. He was also the editor of Maclean's magazine for more than a decade and was appointed to the Order of Canada in 1978. Newman's wife says he died from complications related to a stroke he suffered last year. And Bruce Springsteen is postponing the rest of his concerts in September on doctor's orders. The 73-year-old revealed he's being treated for peptic ulcer disease. He says he's heartbroken, but will be back soon, and the concerts will be honoured with new dates. Well, red carpets are rolling out tonight for the start of the Toronto International Film Festival. But as Ithil Musa shows us, strikes in Hollywood are giving the festival here a much different vibe. Celebrity photographer George Pimentel is used to capturing the biggest stars on the red carpets at the Toronto International Film Festival. This is where it all began, 1993 at the Elgin Theatre. But many of those stars aren't coming this year. Hollywood actors and writers are on strike over pay and the use of artificial intelligence, meaning Pimentel will have to find a new focus this year. I will have to adjust. I will have to give credit and exposure to directors now, which is good. Hi, guys. TIFF generates more than $100 million for the region, and major celebrities are one of the driving forces of that economic activity. People aren't just coming to see a movie. They're coming to see a movie star in the flesh. So uh, you take that component out, and a lot of the, uh, the air goes out of TIFF. Businesses that rely on star-studded events say the absence of A-listers will affect their bottom line. It's a big event for the whole city, uh, from your limos to your restaurants to your hotels to the, uh, the industry itself. Um, so yeah, definitely it is disappointing. TIFF is also dealing with another major bump in the road. It's parting ways with its lead sponsor after 28 years. Bell says it opted not to renew their sponsorship in order to invest in other opportunities. In a statement to CBC News, TIFF said, We extend our sincere gratitude to Bell for their unwavering support, dedication and collaborative spirit and look forward to working with them in new ways. This development is leading some to question TIFF's future star power. You have to have that glitz, I think, to make a festival attractive. Some say with fewer Hollywood stars in attendance, up-and-coming homegrown talent will have more of a chance to shine. TIFF says 50 Canadian titles will be featured at this year's festival. Idil Moose, CBC News, Toronto. There's lots to celebrate about the return of the Toronto International Film Festival. And here's another return we're happy to see. With Canadian politics set for a dramatic autumn, Rosie's back with that issue.
The end of summer has brought with it a new political narrative. There's increasing pressure on the Liberal government to help Canadians while trying to turn around their own political fortunes. From that Liberal challenge to Pierre Poilievre's new momentum, a test of his ability to connect with Canadians while keeping the base happy. Let's break down what's at issue. Hello there, I'm Rosemary Barton. At Issue is back with Chantal Hébert, Andrew Coyne, and Althea Raj, who's in Quebec City for the Conservative Convention. Good to see everyone. Uh, I guess what we are trying to figure out today is how the summer has changed the political landscape, because I, I think it has, and how concerned the Liberals should be about what we're seeing. Chantal, let's start with you. Do you, do you think that after the Cabinet shuffle, which was the last time we all spoke, um, the, the, anything changed for the Liberals in terms of how they were dealing with these issues that are on the minds of Canadians? I don't think that uh, it was the cabinet shuffle that changed anything, except to raise a lot of question marks about what exactly uh, liberal strategists thought they were accomplishing with that shuffle. Uh, but I think what we saw over the summer is a replay of what we saw over the uh, inquiry over uh, uh, on Chinese interference in the electoral process. In clear, the government always playing catch up. And on, on, on the Chinese file, and that's not to diminish it, that may not have been an issue that mattered to a lot of voters. Right. But over the summer, what they have been doing and they are still doing is trying to play catch up on an issue called housing, mm -hmm. which actually connects with voters. Yeah. And you can see the damage in the polls. Well, one of the things that some liberals say to me, Andrew, is that um, they, they saw that cabinet shuffle and then they weren't given anything to say, anything new to say at the doors over the summer. So they weren't sure why that happened and they weren't sure how their fortunes will improve if they don't have things to say. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's quite a remarkable shift that we've seen. I mean, going into the summer, the liberals were on average about five points behind the conservatives. They're now in some polls 12, 13, 14 points behind. So something has certainly happened. I think what happens oftentimes with governments is a bunch of issues coalesce in the public mind into one big issue. And what triggered this, I think, was that the increasing salience of the housing issue as the interest rates continue to rise and really started to bite people, even as housing prices themselves haven't really fallen very much. Um, and the absence of, of any coherent plan from the, from the federal government to deal with it. And in fact, that infamous statement by the prime minister that it wasn't even really federal responsibility. I think that kind of clicked with people of, well, did they have a plan about anything? I mean, the most striking numbers from those, that abacus poll that came out was, they asked people, does the government have a good plan, a bad plan, or no plan on a series of issues? And on virtually every one, um, very few people said they had a good plan. Some more said they had a bad plan. But the biggest single number of people said they had no plan. Mm. When that becomes the perception of the, or, or the reality that, that you're kind of adrift uh, and rudderless and don't really, they're kind of asleep at the wheel, mm. uh, that, that's, that's not good news for a government if that perception kicks in. So, Althea, why do you think this is happening? What, why, is, why are they kind of struggling a bit? Uh, well, there's a couple of reasons why. And Andrew is right to point out that, like, basically the, the plunge over the summer. Pierre Polyev has really successfully changed his messaging from freedom, which we were talking about a year ago, to talking about people's pocketbooks, mm -hmm. something he started uh, as soon as he got the leadership, but really has pounded. And now, like, you, when you ask people to talk about issues, they talk about inflation in the same way that Pierre Polyev talks yeah. about yeah. Uh, inflation. His messaging has worked. He has yeah. had ads and heavy rotation in key marketplaces across this country that have helped soften his image. And in the meantime, the Liberals have offered nothing. They have not countered Pierre Polyev's messaging on policy. They have not countered Pierre Polyev's messaging on like his own brand. Right. So it's okay. not... I don't know that it's really about the policy. I think there is no message. Like, the Liberals don't have a message. And when you ask Liberal MPs, that is the number one thing they yeah. complain about. Yeah. Uh, we're going to talk about Poiliev in the next block, so, so try not to use all your lines about Poiliev here. But, Chantel, why do you think the government has not been able to turn things around? And, and I guess my other question would be, as someone watching them, why, you know... Why are they not more concerned? Even if an election's maybe two years away, but why do they not seem to be acting concerned? 
Well, why have they, they not succeeded in turning things around? Uh, because they did nothing to turn things around. Uh, you could basically argue that this has been an empty liberal summer. They were absent uh, from the battlefield uh, and continue to be until today with this announcement that got the uh, inquiry into uh, foreign interference out of the way. But I've covered a lot of um, governments that were coming close to the end of their reign. It's true that that tends to happen uh, in a third term. Yeah. But I have never seen one that does not try to fight back for its survival until the summer. What do you think, Andrew? Is that what's missing here? I think the, the big problem they've got is that people are tuning out the prime minister. I mean, the numbers on the prime minister, on Justin Trudeau, are extraordinary uh, and negative. Uh, people, I don't think, are listening to him anymore. So I'm not sure that he's going to be able to, to really mount that kind of fight back. I mean, yeah, the election's probably a year or two away. Uh, but you, you have to go back a fair bit to find a, a governing party that was behind its leading opponent by 14 points in the polls. Uh, you, you know, that kind of thing is, it's not impossible to turn around, but it'd be yeah. unusual. Uh, Chantal and then Althea, yep. The last uh, time we saw a government uh, with that far of a, uh, of a loss was uh, Brian Mulroney, yeah. not to bring back, back me bad memories <laughs> yeah. for the liberals. But, uh, but that's, that's a fact of life. I'm not saying that will be the case, but yeah. I do agree that people are tuning out the prime minister, perhaps because he's not saying much of anything. Yeah. So, so what, what, what are liberals going to do then, do you think, Althea, if they're trying to, I think, try and show empathy with Canadians and get them to pay attention to their message, too? Yeah, well, I mean, Chantal hit the nail on the head. Uh, what's going to happen next week is that the Liberal caucus is going to uh, meet in London, Ontario, and the Prime Minister is going to likely hear an earful. I spent the last two weeks talking to backbench MPs, basically, um, lots and lots of them, and they all have... They all complain about the Prime Minister's office, about the Prime Minister himself feeling like he's checked out, uh, that the government is rudderless, that there is no plan, that there's no focus, that they have too many priorities, that they have like nothing to put on the window, but mostly that they haven't been able to communicate their message. That you're doing, you know, they're spending a lot of money. They have invested a lot, whether it's dental care or child care or even housing, mm -hmm. but they're not good at explaining their own policies. But, um, and yeah. that is something Caucus wants to change. Uh, whether that will result in changes, I don't know. But, you know, I next on the yeah. agenda is basically the PM getting prepared to hear an earful of complaints from yeah. MPs who've spent the entire summer knocking on doors and have heard yeah. that people are really angry. E either we're talking to the same MPs or all the backbench MPs are saying the same thing. We should, uh, and, <laughs> we should say one other thing, which yeah. is that, it, uh, and I know we'll be talking about Paul but def his numbers have definitely improved as well. Now, whether that's because they've been softening his image or what have you, or whether it speaks because people have decided they want to get rid of the government and they've decided, therefore, to look at him in a more prime ministerial vein, I don't know. A wise old yeah. pollster said to me once, when people have decided to get rid of a government, it doesn't matter who the other guys are. Yeah. Uh, Chantal, last word. That's true, but the environment within which governments operate these days have nothing to do with what we've seen in the past, and two years is a hell of a long time. So we don't really know what the environment will be for the next campaign. Yeah. Also, I know you want to talk about Pierre Poilier, so let's do this. Um, it's not great to be so far ahead this early. It's great for a convention, sure, but it's sure. going to be hard to sustain. Okay, so keep those thoughts because we're going to take a little break. Then you can talk about them all you want. Uh, we're going to take that break coming up. We'll be back with more at issue. And we've been talking about conservatives in Quebec City for their national policy convention. With the wind in their sails, how does Pierre Poilievre convince more Canadians that he's the man uh, to be the next prime minister? That's next on The National. Welcome back to another round of At Issue. Conservatives across the country gathering in Quebec City for the party's policy convention. Conservatives will get back to the common sense of the common people. We will make the country work for the people who've done the work. Conservative leader Pierre Poiliev seems to be connecting with Canadians. Polls show the party has momentum. And in his speech tomorrow night, Poiliev needs to keep supporters happy and new voters interested. 
Okay, let's bring back everybody, Chantel, Andrew, and Althea. Althea, you're in Quebec, so I'm going to start with you. Uh, any conservative I've talked to over the past couple of weeks is much happier than they've been in quite some time. What, what, what are you getting the sense, what kind of sense are you getting on the ground there? Yeah, I would say almost that they are jubilant. Uh, <laughs> caucus members uh, entered Quebec City, like the meeting this morning, with big, wide smiles. But the delegates are also really enthusiastic. I mean, I think they would have been enthusiastic uh, because this is the first time in five years that they're meeting in person. But of sure. course, this bump in the polls has them really excited. Um, under Pierre Poilievre's leadership, I mean, he won with such a huge margin of support that really the party belongs to him. And everybody here is... You know, they may not think that he's the greatest thing, but they think he's the man for the job. And they think that uh, the party, you know, that he can lead them basically to government. So there's um, there's real unity and it's not yeah. forced unity. You know, we often yeah. go to conventions where uh, they try to make a show of unity. This unity is genuine. Chantal. Yeah, well, the last time I covered people who were jubilant about a leader who had yet to fight an election was Paul Martin. Uh, and, and an election is a serious test. Forget the polls, because if the polls were to be believed, Paul Martin was going to sweep the country, mm -hmm. except he didn't. So um, it, it is great for Pierre Poilievre that his first convention as leader, which yeah. is important, is happening in this context. It is really dangerous for the, the conservatives to be fitting the drapes to whatever the prime ministerial residence will yeah. be in a couple of years before yeah. they actually fight that election. Yeah, because to be clear, they're, they're, they're high in the polls right now, but there's not a lot of policy, obviously, out there from Pierre Poilievre. And, and I don't know that there needs to be the, this early, uh, this early uh, before an election, but um, I guess the question, Andrew, would be how does he maintain any of this momentum uh, when the scrutiny will inevitably be deeper? Yeah, I mean, he's got to stay on message, as they say, in particularly in terms of affordability and pocketbook issues, the kind of, you know, meat and potato stuff that is, I think, really mostly responsible for where they're at in the polls right now. Right. There's been lots of the usual media coverage before this, you know, speculating that there'll be this or that resolution that will cause him all sorts of grief. Uh, I actually don't think he's going to have a lot of trouble. He owns this party. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, uh, that I think caused people concern in past con conventions was, did this signal who was actually in charge? Uh, was was yeah. nice Aaron O'Toole in charge, or was there some darker force out there that was going to take over as soon as he got into power? Uh, you can say what you like about uh, Pierre Polyevre and his message and his style, but what you see is what you get. I don't think it'll be very hard to say that there's some unknown out there that's going to take over from him. He is the, the, the face and voice of this party because he represents it. So I'll tell you one in there. Yes, uh, what happened to Aaron O'Toole at this convention, a virtual one, uh, is uh, what hurt him most, i.e. delegates deciding they were voting against a resolution that says climate change is serious. Yeah. Yeah, You're not going to see anything like that at this convention. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and yes, there are resolutions that could turn out to be cumbersome, but uh, Mr. Poilier bought himself some insurance by saying outright, uh, that he wasn't bound by any of those resolutions. So and Althea, the party is yeah, not going to object because yeah. they're in love with him. Okay, let's go to Althea because you're there and I, I know you'll be watching the resolutions. I know you're kind of a nerd about resolutions, in fact. Uh, so <laughs> do you think that there are, that's going to be a challenge for him uh, on the floor? Actually, I don't. And maybe I see things a little bit differently than Andrew and Chantal. And for some uh, viewers, obviously, they may not agree with... Uh, some of the policy proposals that the Conservative Party has put forward, and uh, Mr. Polyev might try to distance himself depending on the audience he's talking to. But I do not believe that there's any policy in this book that the leadership is completely embarrassed by. And in fact, some of the resolutions that in the media we've spoken about as being more controversial, for example, you know, um, how your what gender your child identifies with at school, whether or not uh, teachers would have to tell parents about that. Yeah. Um, there is a lot of enthusiasm for these types of measures in this room. In fact, I would say it's even a motivating factor that has brought people sure. to Quebec City. And they believe that most Canadians agree with them. Yeah. And so while it uh, may not be popular with some Canadians, some very vocal Canadians, um, there is, you know, it's... Um, it's it's not yeah. seen that way in this yeah. room at yeah. all, and I believe yeah. it's not seen that way by Mr. Poliev's team either. Chantal? 
Okay, uh, but there are other resolutions that have caught attention, for instance, in Quebec. One of those says, uh, why, while you're doing away with the CBC, do away with Radio-Canada. And I'll yeah. just remind people <clears throat> that a lot of pundits laughed at the notion that culture cuts could cost Stephen Harper his majority uh, in 2008, and yep. that is exactly what happened. Yep. So those small resolutions, and no one saw the resolution about not uh, stating that climate change is a serious issue coming, yeah. including most of us, until they voted it down. So, so what what is yeah, that risk? I don't here? think on yeah. the CBC resolution it will pass. Like, I I would be very surprised it would if it will pass yeah. because the leadership will speak against it. Yeah, a Andrew, what what is the risk here then for for Poiliev, um, after a, a pretty successful summer? What's the what are the risks for him? I think the biggest risk is that he doesn't appear authentic, and so far he's doing a pretty good job of seeming authentic, whether you like what that is or not. According to the wisdom of people like me, he shouldn't be at <laughs> where he's at in the polls right now. Right? He should be too off-putting to centrist voters in suburban, uh, suburban Ontario. Well, he's doing plenty fine with suburban voters in Ontario. So uh, uh, I think the biggest risk for him is, is, to repeat my point, is if people see there's a conflict between what he says and what he's actually going to do or between his leadership and where the party is actually going. And right now you would say there's very little um, daylight between them. The, the, the party is going where he wants to go. He's going where the party wants it to go. Yeah, uh, Chantal, then Althea. I don't think that the test of, uh, of that balance is going to be at this convention, frankly. But I do believe that his speech is going to be important, more important yeah. than any of the debates over whatever resolution is yeah. on the floor. Well, it's, it sounds like they've been working on the speech for an awful, awfully long time. Because, for, because to your point, Chantal, the first time for him to sort of speak to the country uh, in, in this uh, job. So, Althea, what, what, what do you think are the risks for Mr. Poiliev? Well, the second time, I would say, because he did speak to the country when second. he won the leadership. Yes, but, yes, yes. yes, um, yes. The, the biggest challenge, frankly, is that he's going to be opposition leader likely for two years. And right now he can talk about common sense and bringing it back home. And people project what they think that he's talking about, what that yeah, means. That's right. But two years is a long time to sustain being an empty canvas where people have projected their hopes and aspirations onto you. He will have to say more and that will become yeah. more controversial. Okay, guys, we will leave it there for this week. So glad you're all back. And I know the audience probably is too. <laughs> See you again next Thursday. And with that, I'll send things back to Adrian in Toronto. All right, thanks, Rosie. Next, three sailors attacked by sharks and stranded at sea. Yes, we, we make my day call. Yes, shark attacks. The rescue before they sank in our moment. When these souls set out on their expedition in 2021, it was meant to be a round-the-world trip, emulating Russian explorers of the 19th century. But on Monday, the inflatable vessel was attacked by sharks, and then again on Tuesday, piercing the hull and forcing the three men on board to call for rescue. Their harrowing adventure is our moment. Yes, we, we make my day call. Shark attacks, they broke our balloons. We have inflatable balloons. It was many times attacked by Brazilian shark cookie cutter. They hunt uh, inflatable boats. And we just uh, have many, many holes and started to go down. And the last night, the Panama cargo, Dug Dugon Ace, come to us and saved they us. This shark attacks situation, it was extremely unusual. We lost the boat. It's a catastrophe. That shark is like this, very small. And it was a trouble that they attacked backside because we have rudder system on the backside and if it is less and less and less air, the rudder system destroyed very quickly. We're, we're happy that I alive and <laughs> I spoke with my family and my wife tell me, go home, go home. <laughs> no kidding, go home. Did you catch that, though? Those sharks are only 16 inches long. They're called cookie-cutter sharks. They have these, they just latch and then twist. It's, it's a total nightmare. Despite all that, apparently they still want to complete their trip. For all of us here at The National, thanks for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app and subscribe to The National's YouTube channel. I'm Adrian Arsenault. Take care.